Giving thanks. A Love on Palmer Island Romance. Written by Suzanne Ash. Please like and subscribe to my channel. Chapter 1. It Couldn't Be Her. Matt followed the short little brunette with his eyes as she continued to stroll down Main Street. He pulled into one of the parking spots and climbed out of his truck. Rachel? She turned and their eyes locked. His breath caught in the back of his throat and memories started to flood his mind. Images of Rachel cheering him on during football games, of hanging out at the small diner after the game, and of sneaking a kiss on her grandma's porch after taking her home in the same old truck that was parked just a few steps away. Matthew. Rachel was the only person who called him by his full name and got away with it. She strode over, her tall leather boots, clicking on the pavement as she made her way to him and wrapped him in a hug. He took a deep breath, smelling the honey vanilla scent of her hair. It was as if she'd never left. For a split second, he let himself enjoy the hug, the feeling of holding her in his arms again. Then Matt stepped back and forced himself to remember the worst day of his life. The day she'd chosen Roger over him and left for California. What are you doing on Palmer Island? he asked. He hadn't seen his high school girlfriend here in their sleepy South Carolina seaside resort since she'd moved. He'd spoken to her grandmother a few times, but as far as he knew Rachel hadn't come back for a visit in the past six years. I moved back last week. A strange expression washed over her face. The boys and I came home to take care of Grandma Mary. Matt wasn't sure what to make of this statement. Who were the boys? Is everything okay with Mary? He regretted the words as soon as they left his mouth. It was obvious that the older woman wasn't fine, or Rachel wouldn't have come back to care for her. His suspicions were confirmed when he saw her swallow hard. Tears were pooling in her pretty hazel-brown eyes. Not really. She was diagnosed with breast cancer a couple of weeks ago. Rachel dabbed at her eyes with the back of her index finger. Still worried about smudging her mascara, he noticed. He was one of the few people who'd seen her without makeup since they graduated from middle school. And that was only because he used to sneak into her bedroom whenever bad thunderstorms rolled through. She was scared to death of the storms since losing her dad in fishing accident during one of them. He'd hold her shivering body until the storm passed, before sneaking back out the way he'd come. He still thought about her each time thunder started to rumble in the distance. That doesn't sound good. How's her prognosis? He liked Mary and couldn't believe this was the first he heard about all this. News usually traveled fast on the small coastal island, connected to the South Carolina mainland by two causeway bridges. Actually, it's pretty good. They caught it early and started treating her with radiation and chemo right away. And you know Mary, she's not going to give up without a fight. Rachel barked out a laugh. She's grumpy as you get out, but she's not going to let it beat her. At least I hope it won't. The last few words came out quietly and with more uncertainty than the first. He hated to see her like this. In pain. Part of him ached to put his arms around her and help her carry that burden. But it wasn't his place to do that anymore by her choice. The pain was palatable. She'd broken up with him the day after graduation and left town with the new guy a few days later. That was the last time he'd seen Rachel Blackwell and he couldn't believe how much the rejection still hurt. And now she was back. Want to grab some coffee and catch up? He heard himself say. Where had that come from? The last thing he needed was to spend more time with the girl that had gotten away. The girl he still found himself thinking about more often than he liked to admit. I'm sorry, Matthew. I wish I could. She glanced down on her phone. He wasn't sure if it was to check her messages or the time, or to give herself an excuse to get out of a coffee date. I have to get back. I've been gone too long already. He did his best to ignore the pain, the feeling of rejection spreading through his chest. He forced a smile on his face. No problem. I'm kind of busy this morning myself. I'll see you around. He started to turn when her hand on his arm stopped him, 
The warmth of her fingers curled around his bicep traveled all the way through his abdomen. Wait. I would love to catch up, he heard Rachel say. He turned. You would? Yes, of course. How about tomorrow morning? I'm free any time after nine. Her eyes were flashing up at him, and a strand of dark brown hair fell into her face. He ached to tuck it back behind her ear, taking the opportunity to run his fingers through it. But that wasn't something he could do. Not anymore. Matt swallowed hard. Okay. How about coffee at the roasted bean around ten? He had no plans in the morning but didn't want to seem too eager to see her. Rachel nodded. It's a date. I'll see you then, she said before turning and walking off. He looked at her until she vanished around the corner and out of his sight. Rachel sat in her car in the driveway for a moment, trying to compose herself. Why was Matthew Miller one of the first people she had to run into since returning to Palmer Island? She knew it was going to happen sooner or later, but had hoped for later. And a chance to steal herself for the encounter. In the past few months, she'd been thinking about him more and more often, and the fact that her grandmother kept bringing him up, telling her how helpful he was around the community didn't help either. Thanks to Grandma Mary, Rachel knew he was still single. She wondered if he'd dated much since she left. Left and broke his heart. At least one of her worries had been dealt with. He didn't seem to hold a grudge. She'd left and she knew it had hurt him. She'd been young and stupid. Rachel had grown up on Palmer Island and couldn't wait to get out of the small, tight-knit community. Roger had looked like her one shot to do that. If she'd stayed with Matt, they'd be married right here on the island now. Six years ago that had seemed like her worst nightmare. Now she found herself wondering if leaving and breaking up with him hadn't been the biggest mistake of her life. Rachel's phone beeped. She glanced down and saw a text from Grandma Mary. Are you coming in, was all it said. Rachel smiled. She shouldn't be surprised that her grandmother had spotted her. She was probably ready for a break from watching Andrew and George. Rachel's young sons could be a handful. She grabbed her purse and the bags from her morning errands and headed inside. There you are, her grandma said. Rachel felt bad about how long it had taken her to get groceries and pick up a few treats from the bakery when she heard the relief in her grandmother's voice. Look who's come to visit. Rachel set her bags down in the kitchen and walked into the living room. Miss Doris, it's so nice to see you. She was genuinely happy to see her grandmother's best friend and notorious busy buddy. The older woman, with gray hair and the most stunning steel-gray eyes Rachel had ever seen, engulfed her in a big hug. I'm glad you're back. Miss Doris told Rachel, before whispering, thanks for coming to take care of Mary. She needs you. Rachel patted Miss Doris's shoulder in a silent response. She noticed herself how much her grandmother needed her help the moment she'd returned. Thanks for calling me, she whispered, before stepping out of the hug. Who wants coffee and a muffin? The three of them chatted with only a few interruptions when the boys tore through the living room, their stuffed animals in tow. Rachel got them settled in their bedroom with the large Lego blocks and a challenge to build the highest tower they could. How was Main Street? Miss Doris asked. Did it change much since you left? Not at all. There's a new flower shop, but everything else looked the same. Including the people. Which reminds me, Rachel turned to look at her grandmother. Do you mind if I stay out for an hour or so after I pick up your prescription tomorrow? I ran into Matthew. She stopped when she saw two pairs of eyes staring at her intently. Oh, please, we're just having coffee. I'm catching up with an old friend. Don't you two get any ideas? Both older women harumphed and Rachel realized too late that she'd said too much. This was not going to end well. As if she wasn't nervous enough already about spending time with Matthew. Chapter 2 The sun was streaming into the large windows of the roasted coffee bean, making Rachel's hair light up in different shades of brown, red, and gold. He had a hard time keeping his mind on their conversation.
Instead, he was losing himself in a daydream of running his fingers through her hair and cupping her face to capture it in a kiss. When had he turned into a lovesick teenager? He shook his head. Sorry, run that by me again, he said, feeling the heat creep up his neck. So far their coffee date had gone well. They talked about high school and the people they'd hung out with. Most of their friends were still on the island, but Rachel had only stayed in touch with a handful of them. He caught her up on who had married who and what they were up to. She'd told him about Fresno, the office she'd been working at the past few years, and her dream of finally starting college. I said, it's not going to be easy to take classes again. Especially now with George and Andrew. Who? He didn't remember going to school with a George or an Andrew. My sons. Rachel stared at him for a moment, an incredulous look on her face. Then she blinked. Oh, I'm sorry. You had no idea, did you? My sons. The words ran through his mind in an endless loop. Rachel was a mom. A mother of two boys, by the sound of it. He took a deep breath. Tell me about them. He leaned back in his chair. George is the oldest. He's four. Andrew is two. I was pregnant with him when Roger left. I've been raising them on my own for the past few years. She barked out a laugh. To be honest, I've always raised them by myself. She shook her head. Never mind. The point is, I'm a single mom to two young boys. She stared at him defiantly. Is that going to be a problem? Matt was too shocked to respond. How did you reply to that? He was still trying to come to terms with the image of Rachel as a mother. He grabbed his cup and took a sip of the coffee that was starting to go cold, buying some time until he could figure out what to say. Of course it wasn't a problem. You know what, he watched her stand up and push her chair back. This wasn't such a good idea. I need to go. He saw disappointment in her eyes, and something else. Anger maybe? Rachel grabbed her purse and marched out the door before he could stop her. He sat there for a moment, stunned. She talked about her kids and like an idiot, he just stared at her. No wonder she thought he had a problem with her and her kids. He didn't. He was curious about the boys, George and Andrew. And he'd screwed this up by not telling her so. He grabbed his coat and returned both of their coffee mugs to the counter. He dropped an extra couple of dollars into the tip jar and left. He was heading to his truck when he saw Rachel in her car. She was trying to start it, but the engine wouldn't roar to life. She looked upset, close to tears if he was honest. She didn't notice him walking up and jerked up when he knocked on her side window. Car trouble, he asked, before chiding himself for being Mr. Obvious. This really wasn't his day. Rachel opened her door and stepped out, wrapping her arms around herself. It's not starting. I'm not sure what's wrong. It's been giving me trouble for a couple of weeks, but it usually works after a few tries. Let me take a look. He stepped around her and reached into her car to pop the hood. It's probably the battery. Let's see if we can jump start it. He got his truck, parked it close to hers and attached the jumper cables. When I give you the signal, try to start it again, he instructed. She shook her head, looking defeated. Nothing. I don't know what to do. I need to get home. Grandma is waiting. Maybe I can call a cab or a ride share, or something. She started to dig around in her purse. Don't be ridiculous, he said, regretting his words immediately, when he saw the hurt in her eyes. I didn't mean it like that. What I meant to say is, why don't you let me drive you home? He could see her struggling to make up her mind. I don't know if that's a good idea. It's no trouble. It's almost on the way for me. He kept glancing at her. I'll call a friend of mine who has a garage here in town to look at the car and tow it if needed. If that's okay with you? He could see her hesitate for a moment, then she took a breath and let her shoulders slump. That would be great. Thank you.
Her hesitant smile that didn't touch her eyes broke his heart a little more. Thankfully it was a quick drive to Mary's house. He struggled to make small talk. Rachel stayed quiet, answering his questions about the car, the boys, and Mary in as few words as possible. He'd screwed this up royally and wasn't sure how to fix it. She had overreacted at the coffee shop. She knew she had. Matt wasn't Roger or any of the guys she'd gone out with over the years. She couldn't blame him for needing a minute to get used to the idea that she had two rambunctious boys. Two beautiful boys that she wouldn't trade for anything in the world and who she was fiercely protective of. Rachel took a deep breath and turned to Matt as they pulled into her grandmother's driveway. Would you like to come in and meet George and Andrew? A small smile lit up his face. I'd like that. Rachel hopped out of the truck and strode up to the door, nervous and excited for Matt to meet her children. Out of the corner of her eye she saw Miss Doris's Oldsmobile, parked on the sidewalk. She smiled, grateful her grandmother had help and the company of a good friend this morning. Hello Matt. It's nice to see you again. His grandmother and Miss Doris greeted him, not looking the least bit surprised she'd brought him home with her. Matthew gave me a ride back here. My car won't start, Rachel explained. What are you guys doing? She asked her sons, who were both bent over pieces of construction paper, coloring away. She let out a small sigh of relief when she noticed they were washable markers. Neither one of her boys had mastered the art of staying in the lines, and she was sure there would be marks all over their hands, their shirts, and the kitchen table. We're making turkeys. With our hands. George exclaimed, dropping his green marker long enough to hold up a brightly colored, chubby hand and waving it at her. Handprint turkeys, Miss Doris explained. I used to make them with my boys when they were little. Who's ready for me to cut theirs out, she asked. Not yet, was the unison reply. Rachel watched Matthew sit down next to her oldest. Can I see, he asked and George showed him his handprint and how he'd started to draw the colorful feathers. Wanna help? her son asked, holding a red marker out to Matt. Rachel smiled as she watched Matthew uncap the marker and start to color. She took a seat on the bench next to Andrew and they spent a few peaceful minutes crafting together. What are we going to do about Thanksgiving dinner? her grandmother asked, while Miss Doris and Rachel were busy cutting out the finished turkey masterpieces. Matthew was helping the boys scrub the marker off their hands at the kitchen sink. Rachel glanced over and hoped her grandmother wouldn't mind the abuse of her favorite dishcloth. It's just Sarah and I this year, Miss Doris replied. You're welcome to come over. She looked up at Rachel and then over at her boys. Why don't we have it here? Mary suggested. You can bring a pie and a side dish. Are you sure you're up to hosting a big dinner? Miss Doris looked worried. I'm sure Rachel will help and it would be easier for the two of you to come over here. Mary glanced over at the boys who were busy drying their hands with a stack of paper towels. Matt, do you have any plans? He shook his head. Not really. I usually just heat up one of those hungry man dinners. It's got the sliced turkey and dressing. Miss Doris and Grandma Mary gasped. That won't do. You're coming over to eat a real Thanksgiving dinner and we'll send you home with plenty of leftovers for the rest of the week. Rachel noticed a glance between the two older women and knew there was going to be trouble. Actually, would you mind helping Rachel do the shopping and some of the prep work? Mary asked. I'm really not up to all that after my treatments. It was all Rachel could do to hide a smile. A moment ago, her grandmother had willingly agreed to have everyone over and now she was playing the damsel in distress. It didn't take Sherlock Holmes to figure out why. That would be such a help. With Sarah eight months pregnant, we can't do the usual Costco run. Miss Doris jumped in to help her friend. She grabbed her wallet from her purse, removing a card. Y'all can use my card to get the turkey, potatoes, corn. She paused. We'll make you a list, she finished and looked to Rachel's grandmother for confirmation. They settled the boys with a snack of cookies and milk and got to work planning the holiday meal.
The shopping list, Miss Doris was writing on the back of an old envelope, kept getting longer and longer. Rachel was starting to see why it would make sense to trek all the way up to Myrtle Beach in holiday traffic to do the grocery shopping for what was starting to look more like a Viking feast than a small family dinner. That should do it, Grandma Mary finally declared. Both sides of the envelope were covered in her neat handwriting. The women had consulted a few different family cookbooks and Miss Doris had made not one, but two calls to Sarah to look up a recipe in her own collection. If you head up there early, tomorrow morning, you should be able to find most everything. We can look for anything else at the grocery store here later. Miss Doris looked serious before asking are you sure you're up for it? Of course we are, Matt grabbed the list before Rachel could protest. He glanced down at his watch. I better get going. He turned to Rachel. I should probably drive until we figure out what's wrong with your car. I'll pick you up at 7. We can grab some coffee on the way and make it there before the doors open. She nodded numbly. How in the world had she ended up committing to a mammoth grocery haul all the way up at Costco with Matthew? Chapter 3 the door to Mary's house opened before he had a chance to ring the doorbell. SHH. Rachel had a finger up to her finger. Everyone is still sleeping, she said, before turning around to grab her purse and phone. She stepped out in her midnight blue wool sweater, jeans, and her hair pulled up in a ponytail. She looked exactly like she had in high school, but with less makeup. He liked it, and had to work hard to keep from pulling her into an embrace and kissing her hello the way he used to when he picked her up for school. It didn't take them long to drive over to the roasted bean. Coffee, he asked. She nodded. Yes, please. I need it. I was up half the night with Andrew. She tightened her ponytail and looked around the counter. Want to split a cinnamon roll, she asked, her lips curling up into a small smile. It was their favorite treat to split after early morning football practice, back when they were dating. Sure. Matt ordered two coffees and a cinnamon roll and Rachel asked the young girl behind the counter for two forks. They got settled into a corner table. Is Andrew okay? He's fine. He's had a few nightmares since we moved, really since. Never mind. He's getting better. It's the first time this week. Rachel took a bite and his gaze followed the small bit of pastry up to her lips. Mmm, these are as good as I remembered. She took a sip of her coffee. Matt picked up his fork. She was right. The cinnamon roll was good, and looking at the list Rachel had pulled out of her purse when they sat down, he was going to need all the sugar and caffeine he could get to make it through this shopping trip. We better get going, he suggested after they'd finished their treat. They each grabbed a refill to go and got on the road, Rachel fiddling with the radio until she found a station that played Christmas music. He couldn't hide his smile as she sang off-key and danced around in his truck all the way to the store. He wasn't sure how to feel about the fact that she was comfortable enough to act the way she did back when they were teens. But deep down he hoped it was a sign that maybe there was a chance for them, a second shot at this relationship. The feeling of hope kept growing in his chest as they paced through aisle after aisle, filling the oversized shopping cart with flour, sugar, spices, the biggest tub of lard he'd ever seen, a turkey, a spiral-cut ham and a ten-pound bag of sweet potatoes. He pushed the cart and Rachel crossed item after item off the list. How many people are we cooking for, he asked halfway through the store. Their cart was close to overflowing at this point. Rachel stopped and thought for a moment. You, me, the boys, Grandma Mary, Miss Doris, and Sarah, she counted off. This seems a bit much for seven people, he said, looking down at their cart. The boys won't eat much besides rolls and pie, Rachel added. This does seem a little excessive. Everything was on the list though. She held the envelope out to him. They were pretty specific. At least we're almost done, Matt added before turning the corner into the produce department. What's left? Corn and cranberries, Rachel replied after a quick glance through the list. You don't think they'd mind if we added a few other things, she asked after glancing over the cart again. I'm thinking we could use a few healthier alternatives.
a kale and avocado salad and maybe some roasted asparagus and Brussels sprouts. He didn't like the gleam in her eyes at those words. What's that? California food? He gave her his best, disgusted look, which earned him an elbow to his ribs. Nice to know he could still wind her up. Don't act like you don't know your vegetables, Matthew Miller, she said before stalking off to look through some green stocky plants that looked like the weeds he pulled out of his flower bed each spring. This couldn't possibly be edible. Next, she walked over to look at some dark blue, shriveled up fruit looking things. This can't be edible, he said. What is this stuff? Kale and avocado. You're not seriously telling me you've never had these? She held the offending produce out to him. I practically lived off this the past few years. California food, he said, shaking his head. What's wrong with collard greens and peaches? Actually, some collards would be nice, Rachel said before tossing a bunch of them into the cart. It took them twenty minutes to check out and load everything into the back of his truck. He hoped the weather would hold until they made it back to Palmer Island. Why don't you stay for lunch? Rachel asked. It was the least she could do after both her sons insisted on helping them unload and put away the groceries. It had made the process take twice as long, and Matt had been incredibly patient with both of them and great at finding little jobs for each of the boys. That's a wonderful idea. Please stay Matt. We're having beef and vegetable soup. It's almost ready, just waiting on the cornbread. Mary was busy stirring the pot. The soup smelled great, and Rachel's stomach started to rumble. She poured a glass of tea to hopefully quiet it down until the food was ready. Matt agreed, and Mary sent them both outside to play with the boys. Why don't you two show Matt your new trampoline, Mary suggested to her great-grandsons. Rachel laughed and followed behind as the boys started to pull Matt out the door to the backyard. You're great with them, she commented and handed him what was left of her tea when he plopped down in the garden chair beside her. They are a lot of fun. But man, how do you keep up with them? He sounded a little out of breath, which wasn't a surprise, considering he'd spent the last fifteen minutes bouncing with them in the trampoline. It was, quite the workout. I do what I can and then send them out there to burn off whatever energy is left. She paused for a moment and wondered if it would be too forward to ask him to join her tomorrow. She heard her grandmother's advice in her head. What's the worst that could happen? He could tell her, no thanks, which come to think of it, wouldn't be the end of the world. She bit her lip and dove in. Listen, the boys and I are heading to the turkey trot tomorrow morning. I'm running the 5K and George and Andrew are entering the kitty run. Would you like to join us? Starting the wearing them out part early, he asked with a little smirk. Sure. I'll join you. I have to warn you though. It's been a while since I've gone for a run. Gotten a little soft over the years. He patted his stomach. From what she could tell through his flannel shirt, it was as flat as ever. Great. Want us to pick you up, she asked before adding, it's easier for me to drive with the car seats. The mechanic had called when they were driving home and told her she could pick her car up that afternoon. Before he could answer, both boys yelled for him to come back to the trampoline. He laughed and jumped out of his chair. What time, he asked over his shoulder as he hopped back in. We'll be at your house at 6.15. Race starts at 7. Rachel sat back and watched the three of them bounce and giggle. It warmed her heart to see the boys interact with a grown man like that. It was a new thing for them, and they thoroughly enjoyed it. Roger could never be bothered. In hindsight, she was pretty sure he didn't want kids. He certainly wanted as little as possible to do with them. He liked the idea of having sons and being able to brag about them, but that was the extent of his parenting skills. Her own dad was amazing, but he'd been long gone when her boys were born. With no uncles around, the positive male influence in her boys' lives had been sorely lacking. Not for the first time since running into Matthew on Main Street a few days ago, she found herself wondering what could have been if she'd stayed on Palmer Island. If she'd stayed with him. Married him instead of Roger.
She wouldn't trade having her boys for anything in the world and loved them both fiercely, but deep down she couldn't help wishing she'd had Andrew and George with Matt instead. Food's ready, go wash up, her grandmother called from the back door. Rachel sighed and picked up the empty tea glass. Time to round up the troops and get them washed up before they could eat. She'd make them skip their naps today and get everyone to bed early so they'd be ready for an early start to the day Wednesday. Chapter 4 Ready? Rachel asked when the flag went down and the first racers at the front of the line started to take off. The five-kilometer course ran across the island before finishing just a few yards away from where they were lined up. As I'll ever be, he replied. What was he thinking? He was out of shape and hadn't been on a single run since he graduated six years ago. Yet here he was, a racing number pinned to his long sleeve t-shirt, about to run with the girl that had been a cross-country all-star in high school. By the look of her outfit and shoes, she'd never stopped training. He had a feeling in the pit of his stomach that he was in trouble. It was confirmed when they started to move and he saw the fluid motion of her long stride. The girl was still a runner. He was keeping pace with her, for now, but it was only a matter of time before she'd leave him in the dust. At least it was a short race. Maybe he could hang in there. They ran in silence. Rachel seemed to enjoy the quiet and slipped into the zen state she'd told him about years ago. It was why she ran. It helped calm her mind and forget everything around her. He on the other hand, was quiet to save his breath. He needed every oxygen molecule he was able to draw into his lungs to keep his legs moving at the pace she was setting. Slowly but surely he watched her pull away from him. Not that he minded the view. His pride didn't enjoy it as much, but hard as he tried, there wasn't anything he could do to keep the gap from widening. Instead, he kept his eyes on the road and put one foot in front of the other. If he and Rachel were picking things off where they left them after graduation, he would have to do something to get back in shape. The thought surprised him and he realized he very much hoped they would get back together. It was a goal worth running toward. Rachel was waiting for him at the finish line with a huge smile and a bottle of water. He gulped it down in between trying to catch his breath. Good race, she said, while patting him on the shoulder. She looked like she'd been waiting for a while. When did you finish? A couple of minutes ago. He quirked an eyebrow. Okay. She glanced down at her watch nine minutes ago. Twenty-two minutes isn't a great time, but considering it's been a while, I take it. She looked happy, and he couldn't help grinning back. Where are the boys? he asked when he'd recovered enough to speak. They'd left them in the care of Grandma Mary before lining up for their race. Over there. Rachel pointed at a spot in the crowd and he could see all three of them waving. The two of them walked over, and Mary congratulated both of them on the finish. Is it time for our race now? George asked. Rachel nodded and they made their way to the small obstacle course for the kids. It was a short course, set up as an oval. The start and finish line had a small banner hanging over top and two volunteers held up a ribbon for each runner to cross as they made it to the end. Along the way, there were small obstacles including logs to jump or climb over, ropes to duck under and cones to weave through. They watched a few kids, most of them older than George, complete the course before getting in line. Don't worry about those other kids, Rachel counseled her oldest son. Run your own race. What counts is that you finish. He nodded, a serious expression on his face. She turned to Andrew. You want to run too? Big nods. Follow your brother. I'll be right here when you're done. And they were off. Matt, Rachel, and Mary were watching from the sidelines, cheering the boys on as they made their way around the course. George took the race surprisingly seriously, hitting every obstacle and doing his best to make it through. His little brother on the other hand skipped things here and there and got distracted by the cones until Rachel walked up and coaxed him into finishing the race. You looked good out there, Matt told George when he met him at the finish line. Rachel was still jogging next to the course doing her best to get Andrew to finish. Great time too. He showed the young boy his watch.
He'd started the stopwatch on a whim and was glad he did when he saw the pride in George's eyes. I'm going to be even faster next time. Mom and I are going to train. Yes, we are, Rachel chimed in, dragging Andrew over to them. Great job. I liked how you handled the balance beam part. I never could have gotten over that so quickly. George's smile got even bigger and his cheeks started to turn red. Awesome job all around, Grandma Mary declared. I think y'all deserve a treat after all this running. Would anyone like to stop for donuts on the way home? The boys both screamed and jumped with excitement. Mary and Rachel covered their ears until the excitement died down. What's your favorite kind of donut? George asked Matt as they walked back to Rachel's minivan. The young boy was holding his hand as they crossed the parking lot and Matt liked the feeling of a small hand in his. He found himself looking around to make sure none of the cars were pulling out. That's a tough question. He thought for a moment. If I had to pick, I'd say jelly donuts. How about you? Same. George nodded. Matt looked up and saw Rachel smile at the two of them. She must have been listening. We bought too many donuts and thought we'd stop and share some. Rachel held the box out in front of her. They really had gone a little overboard, filling not one, but two boxes. Rachel vowed to never head to the local donut shop right after a race. Thankfully her grandmother had the brilliant idea of sharing them with Miss Doris and Sarah. That's so sweet of you, Miss Doris giggled literally. Come on in, I have some coffee brewing. I have everyone in the car, Rachel cautioned. I know. I saw them in there. I'm sure there's milk or juice for the boys. Are you sure? Rachel, I raised two boys myself. I know what I'm in for. Give me those boxes and go get them. She grabbed the donuts and walked inside, leaving the front door wide open. Rachel went back to the car and got the rest of the crew, including Matthew. I hope you don't mind, she said, tucking her arm inside his the way she used to back when they were dating. She didn't realize what she'd done until it was too late to pull back. We won't stay long. I don't mind at all. And I don't know about you, but I am ready for a couple of those donuts. He rubbed his stomach and it made her laugh. She nodded as they stepped up and into the beach house. I am too. Remind me not to stop for sweets after a race again. Next time I'm making us eggs. Or protein smoothies. Much better for muscle recovery than jelly donuts. He looked at her in mock surprise. You're expecting me to do this again? The Charleston Bridge run is coming up. If you're game. She looked up at him, wondering how he would take the challenge. That would require some serious training. Matt looked thoughtful. Are you up for helping me get back in shape? I could tag along with you and George. He smirked. Oh, I think your workouts are going to have to be a little tougher than runs around the park with my four-year-old, she shot back. They stepped into the kitchen just in time to hear, said child talk about the donuts to Sarah. Maybe you shouldn't have any. You're looking, kind of big. Rachel, could feel the heat rushing into her face. George. Sarah laughed, before explaining to the boy that she was pregnant. A baby? In your belly? He didn't look like he believed the young woman. Rachel bent down next to her son. Yes, Sarah is growing a baby in her belly. Like mommy grew you and Andrew. We've talked about this. Remember? George nodded. How do you get it out? He asked after finishing a chocolate donut and a glass of milk. Rachel turned to look at Matt, who looked like he was about to choke on the last bite of his jelly donut. I'll explain when we get home. Why don't we go play on the beach while everyone finishes, she said to her boys, keeping her fingers crossed that she could get them out the door before another embarrassing word came out of her oldest son's mouth. Good idea. Who wants to make a sand castle? Matt asked. She was grateful he had her back. Me? Me? Both of her boys were jumping up and down excitedly, 
Matt took each by a hand and then looked at her for help. This way, she said after realizing he had no idea how to take them out back. Hold on, Miss Doris, called after them. She walked to the back deck with them and pulled a basket of sand toys out of the storage area of a bench tucked into one corner of the sprawling back deck. This is perfect. Thank you. Rachel couldn't tell the older woman how thankful she was. Tell Grandma to come get us when she's ready to leave, she called across her shoulder as she ran down the steps to catch up with Matt and the boys. With a little luck, she'd catch up to them before they got their shoes and socks wet in the cold surf. Everything okay with you? Matt asked after plopping down in the sand next to her half an hour later. Sure, why wouldn't I be, she lied. You look worried. It's fine. Just some upsetting news from out west. It'll blow over. She wasn't ready to share with Matthew that her ex-husband and the father of her boys had been texting for the past hour, insisting on seeing his kids for Thanksgiving. The last time he'd taken them for the day, things hadn't gone so well, and Andrew still had nightmares from their trip to the movies. Who took a two-year-old to see a dragon movie? Just because it was a cartoon didn't make it appropriate for kids as young as theirs. Matt, come back. Both her sons came over and pulled him over to the large sand castle all four of them had been building. The boys were busy decorating it with shells and were ready for extra help. It had been a while since she was thankful for their nagging. Rachel took one last look through her text conversation with her ex and said a little prayer that he wouldn't make good on his thread to come out here for a visit. While she had sole custody, she couldn't really keep him from seeing George and Andrew. They were his children too, at least biologically. Yet, the visits never ended well. She couldn't picture Roger getting down on his knees to play in the sand like Matthew was doing just a few feet away from her. No, her ex-husband looked at his offspring as a prop he could use to meet girls and draw the next unsuspecting young woman into his net of lies and deceptions. She didn't think he'd ever played or even read a book with them. Sure, he'd take them to the park near their old house in California and push them on the swings every once in a while, but in hindsight she'd always found out that he was there to start a conversation with some of the nannies and au pairs. He hadn't been a parent, a dad. The only reason he'd taken them to see a movie was so he could make out with his latest girlfriend. George was old enough to notice his father's behavior and report back to her. Not for the first time, she wondered what her boy's life would be like if they had someone like Matthew Miller in their lives. Someone who took the time to listen and talk to them. Someone who didn't mind getting his hands dirty and some sand in his hair. But it was too late. She'd made her choice and had to live with it. Ex-husband who tried to get back into their lives for a guest appearance at the most inopportune time, included. Are you sure everything is all right? Matt asked as they make their way back to the car. Rachel nodded. I'm fine. Really. If there's anything I can do to help. Anything at all, you let me know, okay? He gave her a quick side hug and it was all Rachel could do not to turn around and let him hug her while she sobbed into his shirt. The race and the sleepless nights getting up with Andrew must be taking their toll. It's fine. Just drop it, she snapped before buckling Andrew in his car seat. Chapter 5 Are you ready to tell me what's bothering you? Grandma Mary asked after Rachel, go the boys, bathed and settled in to watch cartoons. They needed a little peace and quiet after their busy morning and there was much to do in the kitchen to get ready for turkey day. Matt had left to grab a shower and a little rest of his own, but promised to return with pizza around dinner time to help them bake. She was grateful for his help, but between him, Mary, and Miss Doris, there were too many people meddling in her private life and constantly asking her if she was okay. She could see why her grandmother got tired of people asking her how she was feeling these past few weeks. It also made her realize that she shouldn't have let her frustration out on Matt earlier and that she owed Grandma Mary an explanation. Taking a deep breath, Rachel sat down at the kitchen table. It's Roger, she said, keeping her hands busy stirring her coffee. I can't say I'm surprised. What's he doing this time? Her grandmother had never been a fan of her ex-husband. Now Rachel wished she'd listened when the older woman had cautioned her against leaving town with the man six years ago, 
He wants to see the boys. And that's a bad thing? Mary looked confused. Rachel couldn't blame her. She'd kept much from her and the rest of her family over the years. She didn't know why. Shame and embarrassment, maybe? It was time to fess up. She wouldn't be able to hide just how crappy of a father and husband Roger had been if he ended up coming to Palmer Island. Plus George knew enough and wasn't beyond telling his great-grandmother about it. I wish it wasn't, but Roger isn't exactly a great dad. Grandma Mary harumphed. This wasn't news to her. It's more than that though. He takes them out and promises them the moon. They go on fun outings and then he gets busy with everything else and drops them like a hot potato. Grandma Mary shook her head. That's sad, but there isn't much you can do about it, is there? You can't force a man to love his sons. She looked sad. There isn't and I do what I can to deal with the fallout. What gets me is the nightmares. He takes them to do the most inappropriate stuff. During their last visit, they went to the movies. Andrew was still having nightmares about those dragons and George didn't stop asking questions about why his dad was kissing some girl while they were watching the movie. Mary nodded thoughtfully. That's not good. And they are getting old enough where they start to notice things. Eventually, they'll realize what kind of man their father is. But I can see why you don't want them to spend a lot of time around him. I assume it's one of the reasons you came out here? Rachel nodded. When you called and told me about she swallowed hard. When you told me about the cancer, I knew I wanted to come and do what I could to help. But yes, putting several thousand miles between Roger and the kids was an added bonus. Thankfully, he didn't give me any grief about it. He actually sounded relieved when I told him we'd be moving to the East Coast. But now it seems he's changed his mind. There's no telling why he wants to spend time with them. I'm not sure what you can do to keep him from seeing them, but it may be worth getting some legal advice. Who knows, maybe there's something you could do about limiting his visitation or forcing him to make what they do age-appropriate or something. I guess I could call my lawyer in California. Rachel's shoulders slumped. She thought about the sad state of her checking account. Chad Brower was an excellent attorney, but he was pricey and putting in a simple question like that would result in a bill for several hundred dollars. Why don't you go talk to Walt Jr. first? He's the local family attorney and the one who dealt with my will and all that. He's a pretty sharp cookie. I'm sure he can at least give you some advice on what would and wouldn't be possible. And he won't charge you for a simple consult like that. Rachel thought this sounded a little too good to be true. She was sure he'd send her a bill, but also that it would be a heck of a lot less than what she paid the guy out west. Would you like me to give him a call and see if he'll see you today? Her grandmother asked. Thirty minutes later Rachel was on her way to see Walt Marcus, Jr. His office was on the far end of Main Street and he'd been happy to see her on such short notice, the day before Thanksgiving. That was small town living for you. Rachel stepped in and introduced herself to the receptionist who was busy clipping coupons and looking up Thanksgiving recipes on her computer. Walk on in, hun. He's waiting for you. Rachel knocked on the darkwood door. Come on in. Walt Jr. was older than she'd expected. In his mid-sixties and dressed in a pair of jeans and a sweater. You're Mary's granddaughter. It's good to meet you. And kind of you to come and take care of her. Rachel forgot how fast news traveled in a small community like this. By now every permanent resident on the island knew she was back and why she'd returned. At least it was for a good reason. And she hoped the news of her failed marriage and the hard time her ex was giving her now hadn't become public knowledge. If it had, Walt Jr. wasn't letting on. How can I help you, he asked after inviting her to sit down in a comfortable leather chair across from him. Rachel explained her situation and shared the recent text messages Roger had sent her. I would have to review your custody agreement to be sure, and I'm happy to do that, but from the sound of it, you're looking at two options. The first would be to go back to court and try to prove him an unfit parent. I can tell you from experience that isn't an easy thing to do unless you can get some undeniable proof that he's putting the boys in danger. 
and my other option? Rachel asked, feeling defeated. While Roger was a bad father, he didn't put George and Andrew in danger or physically hurt them. And even if she tried, how would she go about proving that he didn't deserve to have a part of his children's lives? The other option would be to have him sign over his rights. Walk Jr. looked right at her. Do you think that's something he would do? Rachel shook her head. No way. Besides, his parents would disinherit him if he did that. Roger's parents were the only bright light in all these. They were wonderful people who were excited that she had moved back to the island so they could see their grandsons more frequently. While they weren't happy about the divorce, they'd always been kind to Rachel and had gone out of their way to stay in her son's lives. If you want my advice. Walk Jr. paused, waiting for her nod before he continued. I'd recommend letting him see them if he insists, but don't make it easy for him. Stick to your custody agreement, but don't give him an inch more. Have him work to see the boys. If he's anything like the teenager he used to be, he'll quickly lose interest. As the boys grow older, they'll get more say in how much time they want to spend with their father. Until then, do what you can to protect them while giving them a chance to get to know their father. And who knows, he might surprise you and end up not being as bad an influence as you fear in the long run. Rachel felt a little better when she walked out of the law office. While there was no quick fix for the situation, she knew Walk Jr. and her grandmother would be in her corner no matter what happened with Roger. For now, she'd deal with her ex-husband's visits if he actually ended up making the cross-country drive to see the boys. Her grandmother had been right. Walt Jr. refused to charge her for the consultation. We'll call it a chat between old friends, he'd said as he walked her to the door. Rachel smiled. Palmer Island was a special kind of place. A small town where people still took care of each other. Matt felt dead tired after his shower and spending part of the afternoon doing laundry. He was tempted to stay in and watch the ball game instead of heading back over to Mary's. But he'd promised to help with the Thanksgiving dinner prep work. And he looked forward to spending a little more time with Rachel, even if it was while they were chaperoned by two small boys and a grandmother. He smiled at the thought of how much this would have bothered him as a teenager and pulled out his phone to order a couple of pizzas to take over to Mary's house for dinner. Pizza, 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 the boys chanted while they clung to his legs when he arrived at the house 30 minutes later. You'd think I never feed them, Rachel said, a cute smile, playing around her lips. She took one of the boxes from him and told the boys in no uncertain terms that they would get none of it unless they washed hands and sat in their seats. The threat was surprisingly effective and before long everyone was sitting in Mary's cozy kitchen enjoying their dinner. This is so much nicer than eating by myself in front of the TV, Matt commented after he finished his fourth slice and the salad Rachel had fixed. To his relief, none of the kale they'd bought the other day had made it in. It was plain green lettuce, cucumber, and tomato, drenched in ranch dressing. Just the way he liked it, though he wouldn't have said no to some bacon bits. Who wants to watch the year without a Santa Claus? Mary asked after the boys had torn up much of their pizza. Matt guessed that they ended up eating some of it, but the mess they managed to make with a single slice of cheese pizza and a bit of lettuce with salad dressing was impressive. Me, me, me. They were both bouncing in their chairs. Let's get you cleaned up and into your PJs first, Rachel said, before taking them off. Coffee? Mary asked and started pouring three cups before he had a chance to answer. Matt busied himself cleaning up after dinner while Rachel got her sons changed and settled in front of the TV to watch what both claimed to be their favorite Christmas movie. Last night Rudolph was their favorite, Mary said. She looked tired. Why don't you go watch the movie with the boys, he suggested. Rachel and I will finish cleaning up. That's a great idea, Rachel said. He hadn't heard her step back into the kitchen. You can finish your coffee in there and keep an eye on the boys. Mary nodded and made her way to the living room. With a little luck, the boys will be asleep in the next half an hour and Grandma will have a chance to rest a bit. Rachel looked at him gratefully before picking up the last of the paper plates and throwing them in the trash. It didn't take them long to finish cleaning up and before he knew it, 
he was working on making the first batch of cornbread for tomorrow's stuffing. Where do you keep the cast iron pans, he asked when he'd finished stirring the batter. Rachel pointed to one of the lower cabinets and started chopping onions and celery. Can we help? George and Andrew were walking back into the kitchen. What about your movie? Rachel asked. She pushed a strand of her dark hair out of her face and went back to chopping. There isn't anything for you to help with right now. Go watch Santa. Her tone was a bit impatient. Keeping these two occupied all day couldn't be easy. Do you want to help me make biscuits? Matt asked on a whim. The two boys nodded and he put two chairs close to the kitchen counter he was working on. Hop up here then and let's get some aprons on you. Making biscuits isn't easy, but it's something every man should know how to do. He looked at them with as much seriousness as he could muster. Are you sure you're up for the challenge? You have to follow my directions, or they will turn out tough as hockey pucks. Both boys nodded, their little faces serious. Or at least as serious as you could be while scratching your hair or picking your nose. Rule number one, Matt boomed a little louder than he'd intended. Always wash your hands with soap and warm water before handling food. He walked them over to the kitchen sink and held each of them up while they scrubbed their little fingers. Rule number two, Matt helped them dry their hands and put each of them back on their chairs. Measure carefully. He pulled the bag of flour closer and showed George how to measure the flour. We need one more cup, he said before handing him the cup. He watched the young boy carefully add the flour and level the cup with the back of the spoon. A little of flung across the counter, but all in all, the boy did a good job. Next, we need to add the baking powder, baking soda, and a little bit of salt. He had the boys take turns dumping the ingredients in the bowl. Andrew, stir everything up, he directed the two-year-old. He regretted his decision almost immediately when a small cloud of flour settled on his hair. He could hear suppressed laughter behind him, but refused to turn around. Instead, he looked down at his two helpers. Andrew was grinning while he continued to tap the wooden spoon into the bowl, flinging flour all over the counter. George on the other hand looked concerned. No, Andrew. Don't do that, he scolded his younger brother. We'll get in trouble. Don't you remember what daddy did the last time we make a mess? Matt's wondered what in the world their father had done. George looked genuinely scared. Don't worry. It happens. And really, it's my fault. I didn't tell you about rule number three yet. What's rule number three? George asked, relief washing over his little face. Great question, Matt praised. Rule number three is the hardest one of them all. It's keep everything in the bowl. He scooped as much of the flour mixture as he could back into the large glass bowl and added another heaping tablespoon. Like this, Andrew. He showed the younger boy how to gently stir the dry ingredients before letting him practice on his own. Great job, he praised and had to suppress a proud smile when George echoed his words and patted his little brother on the back, causing him to fling out a little more of the white powder. Matt continued to work with the boys to make the biscuit dough. They used forks to work small chunks of butter into the four. The mixture didn't quite turn out as nice and crumbly as he liked, but since the biscuits would go into the cornbread dressing, he wasn't too concerned. Finally, it was time to add the buttermilk and turn everything into dough. He quickly rolled it out on the countertop handed each of the boys a plastic cup after demonstrating how to cut round biscuits with it. When he turned around to ask Rachel about parchment paper for the baking sheet, he saw her and her grandmother sitting at the table, watching the three of them intently. You guys are doing a pretty good job, Rachel praised. Matt shook his head and grinned. We're making a mess. Don't worry. We'll clean up when we're done. He found the paper and covered the baking sheet before helping the boys transfer the biscuits to it. He could hear Rachel mumble something behind his back. Her voice was soft and he couldn't make out what she said. Don't worry, he heard Mary say. Let them have their fun. I haven't seen the boys this happy and relaxed around a man. We can make another batch later tonight. Matt couldn't help himself.
He turned his head and glanced over at Rachel. She was looking down at the cutting board, chopping onions, and adding them the container of diced celery. She was nodding, and it looked like her eyes were watering. That had to be from the onions though. Chapter 6 Rachel had been up since the crack of dawn to get the turkey baking. Matt, Miss Doris, and Sarah were coming over for lunch in a few hours. The boys and her grandmother were still sound asleep when she heard a soft knock on the kitchen window. She looked up from the potatoes she was peeing to see Matthew Miller standing at her window, waving at her. Hi, he said when she opened the door. Thought you could use some breakfast and an extra pair of hands. He was holding a brown paper bag. Hope you still like country ham biscuits. She could have kissed him. Where in the world did you find those on Thanksgiving Day? She asked as she ushered him into the warm kitchen. Made them myself, he said. After all that baking we did last night, you got up this morning and made more biscuits, she asked. He nodded. It's no big deal. Turns out, it's actually faster when you don't have help. He pulled two of the biscuits from the bag and set them on plates. There are a couple of plain ones in there. I wasn't sure if the boys liked country ham. Rachel was stunned. Not only had Matt remembered one of her favorite breakfast foods, he'd thought about her sons. Knowing they wouldn't enjoy the country ham was pretty impressive for someone who hadn't been around kids much. She doubted her ex would even have considered the boys when placing the order. Rachel grabbed the brown paper bag and pulled one of the biscuits wrapped in waxed paper from it. No way. Matt laughed and grabbed a sandwich of his own. You never had enough faith in me. His tone was light, but Rachel could hear the hurt underneath it. He was right. She didn't have enough faith in him, and not just in the kitchen. If she did, she wouldn't have left with Roger. This is really good. Rachel took another bite of the flaky, buttery biscuit, the salty country ham, and just enough tang from the spicy mustard. Don't sound so surprised. I've picked up a thing or two over the years. His eyes had a twinkle in them and Rachel knew exactly what he was thinking about. She too was remembering the day back in high school when Matt had surprised her after a particularly bad thunderstorm. He'd gone home to make her her favorite breakfast and brought it back when he came to pick her up for school. It was the first time anyone other than her mother or grandmother had cooked or baked anything for her. At the time it didn't matter that the country ham was burnt and the biscuits were hard as a rock. It was the thought that counted. The thought meant a lot to her today too, but it was nice that it was also an amazing breakfast sandwich. Just what she needed before a long morning of cooking. What's the plan? Matt asked a moment later after he'd swallowed the first bite of his own biscuit and washed it down with the black coffee Rachel had put in front of him. The plan is to do as much as possible before Grandma gets up, and then try to take as much off her plate as we can get away with. Sounds good. Put me to work, he said and Rachel couldn't help herself. She leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. Sorry, she mumbled under her breath, before getting up and grabbing one of her grandmother's aprons from the hook behind the door. Matt acted as if nothing had happened. He cleaned up their breakfast dishes and stepped next to her. What would you like me to do first? Rachel glanced through the list she'd made with her grandmother's help last night. The turkey was already cooking. How comfortable are you with macaroni and cheese? We have a pretty cozy relationship and hang out at least once a week, he quipped. She looked at him with raised eyebrows. Yes, I know how to make mac and cheese. Rachel slid the recipe card from her grandmother's worn cookbook his way and showed him where the pots and pans were kept. Let me know if you can't find something, she said before getting busy shredding carrots for the salad and sautéing the onions and celery she'd cut the night before in butter. The two of them worked in companionable silence until the boys woke up. By some miracle, Grandma Mary was still sleeping. Rachel hoped the rest would do her good and tried to keep her sons quiet by feeding them biscuits with honey and letting them watch YouTube videos on her tablet. Matt walked over to to see what they were watching while waiting for the sweet potatoes to boil.
since his cooking skills had obviously improved over the past few years, and he'd done a good job with the mac and cheese, Rachel felt comfortable putting him in charge of making the sweet potato casserole. If she was perfectly honest with herself, she would have to admit that he was a better cook than she was. What are you guys watching? he asked the boys. George pulled out his headphones and told him. Matt looked confused. He turned to Rachel. They watch other people unpack toys. I know. It's weird. I don't get it either, but that's what they all like to watch. It's either that or watching other kids play video games. Rachel turned back to finish making the kale and avocado salad. Matt shook his head and went back to check on his potatoes. What else is left on your list, he asked. Before Rachel could answer, her grandmother barged in, looking frantic. I'm so sorry. I can't believe I slept this late. And on Thanksgiving. Doris and Sarah are going to be here in a few hours. Rachel put a hand on her grandmother's arm to stop her. We're fine. Everything's under control. Matt got here early and helped out a bunch. The turkey is almost ready to come out. The dressing is ready to go in and the sweet potatoes are almost there. She looked at Matt for confirmation. Almost fork tender. I have the topping ready. Shouldn't take long to assemble it all. The macaroni and cheese need to go in long enough to melt and brown the cheese on top. He pointed to the casserole dishes that were lined up next to the stove waiting for their turn in the oven. The table is set, the sparkling water is chilling. We've got this, Grandma. Rachel took her grandmother by the arm and lead her to the kitchen table. Why don't I get you some coffee and a biscuit? Matt made them. You can visit with the boys and take a moment to wake up. Matt poured a cup of coffee and put one of his country ham biscuits on a plate after reheating it in the microwave. He put them in front of Grandma Mary who beamed up at him. You two did all this, she asked as she looked around the kitchen. Sure did, and if you can keep an eye on the boys, Matt and I can get the dining room table set up. Rachel pulled Matt behind her out of the kitchen and down the hall into the formal dining room they only used a few times a year. Use the good tablecloth. The one with the blue embroidery, Grandma Mary called behind them. It's in the bottom of the china cabinet. I know. Rachel tried hard not to get too exasperated. As much as she loved moving back home and being able to be there for her grandmother, it had its challenges. Like living with a grandmother who still treated you like the teenager you were when you moved out for example. It didn't take them long to pull out the table and add extra chairs around it. Rachel grabbed the good tablecloth and started to spread it across the table. Matt reached over to take one of the corners and their hands touched. Instead of continuing with the task, Matt moved his hand to cover her smaller one. She could feel the warmth from his moving into her cold fingers and spread through the rest of her hand and up her arm. Rachel looked down at his strong hand, so familiar from years of holding it as they walked through school. She glanced up and the look in his eyes took her breath away. She saw hope, longing, and the love she thought he might still feel for her. Her heart stuttered as he lifted his other arm and gently cradled her face in his hand. His thumb stroked her cheek. He lowered his head and she was sure he was going to kiss her. Oh how she'd missed his kisses. Rachel closed her eyes. Mom. George walked into the dining room, banging the door into the wall in the process. Rachel jumped back, her face turning red. What are you doing? he asked. Um. Rachel froze. Your mom had something in her eye. I was making sure it was out. Rachel could have kissed him for coming up with that. Turning to face her son, she started to rub her eye. All better now. Oh, okay. Grandma says to use the good silverware. George looked a little confused. What silverware? Rachel could hear Matt behind her trying to suppress a laugh. It came out as a little snort that made her grin. It's forks, and knives, and spoons, that kind of stuff, she explained. Ah. George's eyes lit up with understanding. Because it's all silvery looking. Yes, and sometimes it's even real silver, 
let me show you. Rachel walked over and pulled the wooden case that held the family's silver from the top drawer of the china cabinet. She carried it over to the table and opened it. That doesn't look very silvery, George commented when he saw the varnished cutlery. He looked disappointed. It was Rachel's turn to try to suppress a laugh. It needs to be cleaned. Here. I'll show you. Rachel pulled the cleaning cloth out from under the trays of forks and knives. She picked one of the spoons from the tray and started polishing it. See? All bright and shiny. Why don't you go help your grandmother with the casseroles? George and I can handle polishing the silver and setting the table. Right, George. Matt asked. Her oldest nodded and she left them to their task. He's a good influence on the boys, isn't he, Miss Dora said after she and Sarah arrived for Thanksgiving dinner. George and Matt were finishing up, setting the table. He is, Matt could hear Rachel's grandmother reply. They needed to with their no good father. She trailed off and Matt continued to pretend he didn't hear them. By the time they were done, the food was ready and Mary asked everyone to take a seat. She tapped her spoon on the side of her water glass and everyone went quiet. Before we enjoy this wonderful food that Rachel and Matt worked so hard to prepare, I thought it would be nice if we could each share something we are grateful for. Mary looked around the table, emotion showing on her face. Matt didn't know the older woman well, but it was easy to see that she was grateful, happy, and just a little wistful, looking at the people who had gathered around the dinner table today. I'm grateful that I get to spend another Thanksgiving and another Christmas season with my family, Mary said. She swallowed hard and there was a little catch in her voice as she continued. I'm especially thankful that Rachel, George, and Andrew are here. I've missed you, hun. She turned to Rachel and raised her glass. Glad you're home. Mary lowered her glass and used the napkin to dab her eyes. I'm thankful for good friends who are kind enough to have me over. And grateful I didn't have to get up at the crack of dawn this morning to cook a turkey, Miss Doris chimed in. How about you Sarah? I'm grateful to have found a home and such wonderful people here on the island. I couldn't think of a better place to raise my baby, Sarah said. She turned over to George, who was sitting next to her. How about you? I'm thankful for Pi, he said. Me too, his little brother added. How about you, Mom? What are you thankful for? George looked over Andrew at Rachel. Matt held his breath. He wondered what she would say. I'm thankful that we were welcomed back with open arms. This is home and it almost feels like I never left, she said. Did he imagine it, or was she looking right at him at those last words? Your turn. Matt cleared his throat. I'm thankful to each of you for having me. It's been a little while since I've felt part of a family. He looked around the table and realized just how much he had missed that feeling of belonging and unconditional love. He was the last Miller left on the island and without a family of his own, he hadn't expected to have this again. It's nice. It was a lame finish, but the feelings rumbling in his chest after the almost kiss with Rachel and bonding with George over polishing silver of all things were too much to put into words. Would you mind carving the turkey? Mary asked Matt. He had to swallow hard. It had been a long time since he'd had a big family dinner, but he remembered what a big deal it was for his grandfather and later his father to carve the Thanksgiving bird. I'd be honored, he said and Mary handed him a large carving set. He stepped over to the turkey and looked at it for a moment. He tried to remember what the men in his family did exactly to carve it. I would love a slice of breast meat, Miss Dora said, coming to his rescue. He sent her a grateful smile and started cutting the right breast into slices. Andrew and I want the legs please, George piped up. Matt looked over at Rachel. Do you think you can handle a whole leg, she asked her son. Of course. I have a chicken one all the time. Remember, Mom? George looked competent and Rachel shrugged. Matt pulled both legs and put one on each plate for the boys. Everyone around the table started laughing when they saw the boys' eyes grow wide at the size of the legs. Be careful with it.
There's sharp bones in there, Rachel cautioned, keeping a close eye on both of them as they took a few cautious bites. To no one's surprise, they were done after a few bites and requested mashed potatoes, mac and cheese, and a roll each. Everyone ate too much, talked too much, and laughed a lot. I can't eat another bite, Rachel declared after he'd watched her sample a bite of each of the desserts Rachel and Miss Doris had brought over. Mary and Miss Doris had insisted on putting away the leftovers since Matt and Rachel had done the lion's share of the cooking. Sarah was curled up on the couch with the boys, reading the story of the giving tree to them. Would you like to go for a walk? Matt asked Rachel. She agreed, and they each grabbed a sweater and headed outside. Matt reached for her hand, and she didn't pull away. They strolled down through their old neighborhood, toward the small park at the end of the lane. It had been their place as teenagers. A place to meet, to hang out and talk. And to steal a few kisses under the cover of the willow tree by the pond. I wonder if our initials are still there, Rachel said when they made it down there. She pulled him over to the tree and through the low-hanging branches. Matt knew the letters he'd carved into the tree when they were both in tenth grade were still there. He'd stopped by here plenty of times over the years, reliving the past and thinking about the girl who got away. Even so it was nice to see the surprise on her face. Here it is. I remember the day you carved this. Summer break was almost over and I couldn't stand the thought of going back to school after. She stopped for a moment and took a deep breath. After my dad was declared lost at sea. I was dreading facing everyone. But you told me you would be right there with me. Matt and Rachel forever. She stepped closer to the trunk of the tree and traced their initials with her fingers. And then I left. We were kids. Matt trailed off. He didn't know what to say. Yes, it had hurt and how did he wish life had turned out differently for both of them. But he loved her too much to blame her for going after the life she thought she'd wanted. He stepped closer, standing directly behind her. He could smell the scent of her shampoo. Feel the warmth radiating off her, despite the warm sweaters they were both wearing. He wanted to reach up and run his hands over her dark locks. More than anything he wanted to turn her around and kiss her. The moment they'd shared in her grandmother's living room was haunting him. Before he could get up the nerve to make his move, Rachel turned around to face him. She reached up and cupped his face with her hand. It was even colder than it had been earlier, despite their brisk walk. You shaved, she said, her voice thick with emotion. She raised up on her toes and murmured, I like it, before capturing his lips with her own. Matt was too stunned to move for a moment. When he recovered his wits a moment later, he reached up to cradle her head and moved even closer to deepen the kiss. Rachel put her arms around him and snuggled closer. He hadn't realized how much he'd missed this. Holding her, kissing her, just being around her. Welcome home, he whispered before claiming her mouth again. Chapter 7 Do you want me to fix you a plate? Rachel asked a few hours later. Matt looked up from the TV and nodded. How about you George? Her oldest son was snuggled up next to Matt on the couch. The two of them were watching the Redskins play the Cowboys while Grandma Mary and Andrew took a nap. Miss Doris and Sarah had left shortly after Rachel and Matt had made it back from their walk and aside from the gentle hum of the football game playing on the living room television, the house was quiet. Can I have just macaroni and cheese? George asked. She nodded. It warmed her heart to see her son snuggled up to Matthew. As far as she knew, this was the first time he'd seen a football game. Matt was explaining what was going on in a soft voice. They both looked completely absorbed in the game and Rachel padded quietly in the kitchen to reheat Thanksgiving leftovers. This was her favorite part of this particular holiday. That and the fact that there were no presents and no additional family obligations aside from sharing a big meal together. If that wasn't a reason to be thankful, she didn't know what was. Here you go, boys. She liked the sound of that. Rachel got settled with her plate of leftovers on the chair across from the couch where Matt and George were lounging. They watched the game and she listened as Matt continued to explain what was going on to George.
It was the most fun she'd had watching sports. At some point during the afternoon, her grandmother came back down, Andrew in tow. The booth looked like they'd had a good nap, and Rachel was grateful. It had been a busy and eventful day for everyone, and those two needed the extra rest. She walked back into the kitchen to reheat food for the two latecomers and start another pot of coffee. Grandma Mary walked into the kitchen behind her. Are you making coffee? Rachel nodded. Good. I need it. I can't remember the last time I slept this long during the day. Rachel could hear the unspoken words loud and clear. Except during chemo. It always wiped Mary out. It'll be ready in a few minutes. Rachel pushed the button to turn the coffee maker on and went to sit down next to Mary at the kitchen table. Are you worried about the next round? They would start another series of chemo treatments early next week. I know it needs to be done. I'm just not looking forward to it. At least it's early enough in December that I can recover my strength by Christmas. Mary took Rachel's hand and squeezed it encouragingly. As if she was the one needing the silent support. You'll do fine. Maybe it won't be as bad as last time. Mary hadn't responded well to the drugs. She'd been more nauseous and tired than the doctors expected. And it had taken longer than it should have for her to recover after. Rachel had only been here for the tail end of it, but it had been worrisome. Her grandmother's oncologist had assured them they'd try something different this time and do what they could to make her more comfortable. It is what it is. And don't you worry. I'm not giving up. Mary smiled encouragingly at Rachel. Don't ever doubt that. I want to see those boys grow into fine young men. She got up to pour her coffee and returned to the living room. Rachel took a moment to compose herself. In the hustle and bustle of the past few days, she hadn't had a chance to think about the coming week and the doctor's appointments they had lined up. Then she got to work pulling more food from the fridge and reheating it for dinner. She was just about finished when the conversation in the living room caught her attention. Will you teach me? George asked. Me too, me too. Andrew sounded excited and Rachel imagined he was jumping up and down on the couch. She'd been right. Sit down, or get off the couch, she heard her grandmother say. Furniture isn't for jumping. You have a trampoline for that. Rachel expected her youngest to beg to go outside now that the T-word had been mentioned. To her surprise that didn't happen. Sure. I'll teach you how to throw the ball. We'll get the basics down and I'll keep an eye out for a team for you. I think you're old enough to start playing, she heard Matt say in his deep voice. What was he thinking? George was much too small to play football. He'd get hurt and didn't they have all sorts of trouble with concussions and memory loss, and even a few deaths of high school kids who played? There was no way she was letting her sons get involved in something that could seriously hurt them. She stormed into the living room. What do you think you're doing, she asked, before coming to her senses long enough to pull Matt off the couch and drag him into the kitchen. What's wrong? Matt asked. You can't go promising my boys stuff like that before checking with me first. The exhaustion from the past few days, preparing for Thanksgiving and getting the boys settled in after their move was getting the better of her. Rachel knew it and she knew worrying about her grandmother made her overreact, but she couldn't stop herself. There's no way I'm going to let my boys play football. And I don't appreciate you encouraging them and inserting yourself into our lives like this. She knew she'd gone too far when she saw the hurt in his eyes. Okay. I get it, was all he said before walking out of the kitchen. He said his goodbyes to the boys and Mary, explaining that he had to go take care of a few things at home before it got too late. He thanked her grandmother for the meal, grabbed his jacket and keys and walked out the door without another glance in her direction. Rachel slumped into one of the kitchen chairs and buried her face in her hands. She'd done it again. She heard someone enter the kitchen and a moment later she felt her grandmother's hand on her shoulder. What happened, the familiar warm voice asked. Rachel told her grandmother about her conversation with Matt and how she'd managed to mess things up between them. You like him, don't you?
Grandma Mary took the seat next to her. Rachel nodded. And this wasn't really about football, was it? It's about you getting scared that there could be something real between the two of you. Maybe. I heard him talk to George. I don't think he was planning on getting the boy signed up for a team next week and without your consent. They were watching the game together and I think he enjoyed teaching George. All he promised was to bring a ball over and teach George how to throw it. Rachel raised her head and looked at her grandmother. I don't think that would be a bad thing. Having Matt around these past few days has been good for the boys. Especially George. He needs a strong male role model. Don't you agree? Yes. Rachel hated out weak and unsure her voice sounded. She knew her grandmother was right. Then go out there and talk to him. Ask him to wait while I fix him some food to take home with him. There's no way we can finish all this tomorrow. Mary got up and walked over to grab an apron. I will. Rachel put out a sigh of relief when she stepped outside and saw that Matthew was still there, sitting in his truck. He hadn't even started it up yet. It broke her heart a little how lost he looked. She strode up and knocked on the passenger side window. His head shot up and she saw confusion and surprise in his eyes. He unbuckled his seatbelt, opened the door and walked back to the sidewalk to meet her. Everything okay? he asked. Did something happen? Yep. I totally overreacted. I'm sorry. Rachel swallowed hard and took a moment to compose her thoughts. Matthew waited patiently and that small gesture told her more than a thousand words. There is some stuff going on with my ex that has turned me protective of them. Between that and not enough sleep the last couple of days, I've been running on fumes. And I took it out on you. Which is ridiculous. No it isn't. You're being a good mom, watching out for them. I was a little surprised, that's all. Matthew stepped closer and hugged her. It's fine. I'm a big guy. I can take a little snapping back. Don't worry about it. The tears started to roll down Rachel's face. He was too good to be true. It's not fine, she sobbed. You've been so nice to the boys. To all three of us. And then I turn around and get on you for wanting to throw a ball with George. She raised her hand in between their bodies and wiped away the tears. He would really like that. Good. I'll bring my old football in the morning and we can toss it around in the backyard. You don't think Mary would mind, do you? He asked softly. Rachel laughed through the last of her tears. She won't mind at all. Grandma was the one who talked some sense into me and told me to run after you and stop you. Oh, and she won't let you leave without leftovers. She's packing them up right now. That means I only have a minute to do this. He lifted her chin up to him and kissed her. It was a gentle, sweet kiss that made her forget everything around her. A kiss that made her feel cherished, valued, and wanted. A kiss she never wanted to end and that made everything right with the world again. They pulled apart when Rachel heard someone clearing their throat behind them. Sorry to interrupt, her grandmother said with a chuckle. I didn't want Matt to leave without these. She held a stack of Tupperware containers out. Thank you, Mary. Matt grabbed them and opened the passenger door of his truck. He sat the containers in the seat and turned back around to face Rachel. You're welcome. I'd better head back in to check on the boys, Mary said before walking back into the house, leaving the front door ajar. Matt took another step toward Rachel and lowered his head so their foreheads touched. Why do I feel like a teenager again, he asked softly, his voice tinted with an undertone of something she couldn't quite put her finger on. Because we're hanging out in front of my old house again, with my grandmother watching from the living room window? Rachel asked. Her lips twitched up into a smile. He was right. This made her feel like she was 17 years old again, taking her time to say goodbye to Matthew after a fun day together. Thank you for spending Thanksgiving with me and my boys, she said in a soft voice. I had fun. Matthew gave her another quick kiss before taking a step back. 
I better get going before Mary comes back out to check on us. Rachel nodded. He was right, and she needed to get back inside to help her grandmother clean up and take care of her sons. And then she'd have to find something to occupy them for the next few hours. After their long naps, an early bedtime was out of the question. She groaned at the thought. What? Matthew asked, concern flashing in his eyes. I realized that I need to come up with something to entertain the boys. It's hard for them in a new environment. I brought some of their toys, but it still feels a little like we're here for a visit. It makes it hard to find stuff for them to do that don't tear up the house. Aside from the trampoline. Okay. Matthew had a strange look on his face. I guess that would be hard for them. You're still good with me coming by in the morning to show George how to throw a football. Rachel smiled up at him, her mood instantly lifted at the thought of seeing him again in a few hours. That would be great, she said. George would love it. Rachel, she heard her grandmother call from inside the house. Gotta go. Chapter 8 What are you doing here? Rachel asked, staring at her ex-husband Roger, who stood at the front door of her grandmother's house at 5 o'clock in the morning on Black Friday. She didn't even get up this early to shop. I told you, I wanted to see the boys. Where are they? Roger pushed his way into the house, a large duffel bag in hand. SHUSH, they are sleeping. Don't you dare wake up the house. Grandma needs her rest and the last thing we need is the boys tearing up the house at this hour. She was grumpy. It had taken forever to get them settled down last night. Between the excitement of the dinner, plenty of sugary desserts, and a late nap, she didn't get Andrew and George to sleep until midnight. What do you expect me to do then? Sit here and wait around? Roger didn't sound in a good mood either. At least he didn't have his bimbo of a girlfriend in tow. That's exactly what I expect you to do. The TV is in the living room, there's food in the fridge. Keep quiet. I'm going back to bed. To say she was pissed was an understatement. She walked back up to her bedroom and tried her best to go back to sleep. It took a while. Her mind kept spinning with worry about the boys and what Roger had in mind. Matt was wondering who the new car in the driveway at Mary's house belonged to. He didn't remember seeing the rusty red Oldsmobile before, and he was sure it wasn't there yesterday. Maybe one of Mary's friends stopping by early? He grabbed the football off the passenger seat of his truck and headed for the door. Who are you? The stranger that answered the door asked. Who are you? I'm here to see Rachel. Matt couldn't keep but wonder who this guy was and what he was doing here. She went back to bed. Long night. The guy had a grin on his face. He couldn't be insinuating that. Before Matt could finish the thought, the guy spoke again. I'm Roger, her husband. The guy in front of him crossed his arms and widened his stance as if determined to keep him from entering the house. Her husband? Rachel had referred to her ex back in California. Matt couldn't remember if she'd ever actually said that she'd gotten divorced. Maybe they'd just been separated, or Rachel left him to come out here? Doubt about what the two of them had rekindled these past few days was creeping into his mind. Maybe he'd read too much into their kisses. He stretched out his hand, tucking the football under his arm. I'm Matt, an old friend of Rachel's. I promised George to play some football. Is he up yet? Matt figured he'd play it cool and talk to Rachel about what was going on here. The girl definitely had some explaining to do. After she got up and he got some coffee in her. He knew better than to confront her before she'd had her coffee. Rachel had never been a morning person and from their early morning Costco run he could tell that hadn't changed in the past few years. That won't be necessary, Roger said, holding his hand out for the ball. I can teach my sons how to throw. Played a bit in high school. There was no way Matt was giving this guy the football he'd brought. It was the game-winning ball from his senior year. He'd taken his team to the finals and thrown the final touchdown pass with that ball. I'm sure you have your own ball to throw, 
If not, there's a Walmart up towards Myrtle Beach. Tell Rachel to give me a call. The guy was seriously starting to annoy him. I'll do that. Not sure she'll have much time to catch up with you though, with the move back to California and all. Roger's voice was firm and smug. Move? Matt asked. Rachel had just moved back here and hadn't hinted at even the possibility of her and the boys moving back. And what about Mary? Wasn't she starting another round of treatment soon? That's why I came out here. To get my family back. You know how women are. Rachel ran off after an argument, just waiting for me to chase her down. Guess I groveled enough. Plus the boys miss their friends and their stuff back home. It wasn't a hard sell. Roger shrugged his shoulders. We'll probably be out of here by the weekend. Nice meeting you though. I'll let her know you stopped by. Matt was too stunned at the news to stop the guy from slamming the door in his face. He moved his football and started trudging back to his car. His mind flashed back to the day after graduation when Rachel had told him she was moving out west with Roger, the new kid in town who had big plans making it big in California. The ache in his chest that he'd felt the moment the guy opened the door grew stronger. He should have known better. The last few days had been too good to be true. Rachel was leaving, again. If he couldn't convince her back then to stay, what chance did he have now in her life and that of her boys was back there, with Roger? He got in his car and started to drive. He had to get as far away from Rachel, Mary, and the two little boys who'd sneaked their way into his heart as he could. He knew just where to go. But first he had to go home and pack. When Rachel woke up the second time that morning, it was bright outside. Her headache wasn't getting any better, and there was only so long she could hide out in her old bedroom. She stared at the row of stuffed animals on the shelf and large world map and Vincent van Gogh print tacked to the wall. She'd had such big dreams to travel the world when she was a senior in high school. She made it out to California thanks to Roger, but their life hadn't turned out anything like what she'd imagined. They'd been stuck in a tiny apartment in the middle of the state with no funds to make it even as far as Lake Tahoe or San Francisco. Roger had bounced from job to job going weeks without a paycheck and spending the rest of the time blowing through half their money at the local beer joint and pool hall. Then she'd gotten pregnant with George and Andrew not long after. With two under two, all thoughts of traveling further than the local grocery store to stock up on diapers and formula had flown out the window. She walked downstairs and into the kitchen. Her grandmother was at the stove making bacon and pancakes from the look of it. Andrew was quietly coloring with big crayons at the kitchen table. There's coffee, Grandma Mary said without turning around. She didn't sound happy. Rachel glanced around the kitchen and into the living room. Where's George, she asked as she filled the biggest mug she could find in the cabinet before hunting for a couple of aspirin. Outside, throwing the football. Rachel's heart came to a stop for a moment. Was Matthew here? He'd promised to come over this morning. With that no good husband of yours. Ex-husband, Rachel corrected automatically. I about had a heart attack this morning when I came down and he was sitting at my kitchen table. You could have warned me. Her grandmother still wasn't looking at her. He showed up out of the blue early this morning, Rachel said with a shrug. She felt bad about the whole situation, but what could she do? I'll talk to him. She took her coffee over to the table and sat down next to her youngest. What shall working on? Drawing. What are you drawing? Wafu's truck. Rachel looked down at the red scribbles on the paper. Andrew was drawing Matthew's truck. Her heart melted a little when she realized how close her boys had grown to the man. Good job, buddy. The door to the backyard opened and George came storming in. Are the pancakes ready, Grandma Mary? Just about. Go wash your hands and I fix you a plate. George, Rachel heard her ex boom before the door slammed shut. George was shrinking into himself. We're not done with practice. Get back out there. Roger appeared in the kitchen.
Let's go wash your hands, Rachel said as they walked up to her son, putting her arm around his shoulder. I said we're not done, Roger repeated. He was glaring at her. Give it a rest, Roger. Pancakes and bacon are ready. Grab some food and then you and I are going to talk about this. She walked George out and took a deep breath. Roger was waiting for her when she stepped out of the bathroom. George, go on and get some breakfast. She turned her son towards the kitchen and gave him an encouraging little push. Let's go talk in the living room. She walked away without waiting to see if Roger followed her. He shut the door and turned on her the moment they were both in the cozy living room. Don't undermine my parenting like that, he said between clenched teeth. Rachel barked out a laugh. One look at her ex-husband told her that hadn't improved his mood. His jaw was tight and his face started to look beet red. She couldn't care less. When she'd left California, she'd given up any hope of making things work with Roger. Their marriage had been over for years, but a part of her had clung to the idea that he would be a father to their boys. Now you've decided to act like a parent, she asked. That's rich. She took a calming breath. Getting mad at him would do no good. She needed to get him out of here and if possible out of their lives. Take a seat and let's talk, she said in a calm voice. Why are you here in South Carolina? Roger strode over to the couch and sat down next to her. I missed you, babe, he said, taking her hand into both of his. I missed you and the boys. Come back home with me. I've rented a two-bedroom house for us. You'll love it. There's even a backyard for the boys to play in. Rachel pulled her hand out and scooted as far away from him as she could without getting off the couch. Roger, we're divorced. We split up for a reason. You and I don't work. You know that. What's this really about? Cheryl left. He hung his head. I tried everything. I even signed a lease on a house. He trailed off, looking hurt and lost. You panicked and drove out here. His text messages and his visit out of the blue started to make a little more sense. He'd never been good at living by himself. And with rental prices in Fresno, he likely couldn't afford it on his own. Pretty much, he admitted. You know me so well, Ratch. I need you guys. I do know you, Rachel said, keeping her voice low and warm, to soften the blow. And I know that we don't work. We tried, longer than we should have for the sake of the boys. At least she had, but there was no need to run that in. But the truth is, we make better parents when we're living on opposite ends of the country. You know you'd get tired of us, before we make it through the drive to California. Roger snorted, and she knew she'd picked the right words. He was picturing the four of them in his car for three days, the boys whining, and her complaining that they needed to stop for the day and get a hotel, so their boys could run around and play. It would take them a week, to make the drive. You're probably right. I won't be able to come up with rent and alimony thought. Rachel decided to ignore the last comment. She didn't need to get into an argument with him about child support that she'd never see anyway. In the two years they'd been separated, she'd seen a grand total of three checks from him. For fitting a little money to get him out of her life seemed like a fair price to pay. I know I am. What you need is a roommate. Then do what you can to woo Cheryl back. If she really loves you, you'll have her moved in in no time." Roger nodded, his eyes gleaming with excitement. He was making plans already. Go have breakfast with your boys. Spend a little time with them and then get yourself back home. Chapter 9 That's not good, she heard her grandmother say when Rachel walked back into the kitchen. Mary was on the phone and Rachel's heart jumped into her throat at the words. Was it bad news from the cardiologist? She didn't think there were any outstanding tests. Mommy, mommy, mommy. Andrew's urgent, please called her over to the table. He needed help with his pancakes. Her grandmother must have started to cut them before the phone rang. I'm right here, 
She sat down and finished cutting the pancake on his plate into bite-sized chunks. Want some syrup with that? She grabbed the bottle from the table and poured a little on the plate. Daddy is leaving right after breakfast, but he'll send us some presents for Christmas, George told her around a mouthful of pancake. He didn't seem too upset, which was a relief. As was the fact that Roger was taking her advice. Can we throw the ball again before you leave, he asked, looking at his dad. Sure. Finish your pancake and we'll go back out. Andrew, you want to come play? Roger put the last strip of bacon in his mouth and started to get up from the table, carrying his plate to the sink. Thanks for breakfast, Mary. Her grandmother had finally gotten off the phone. Everything okay? Rachel asked, while she wiped extra syrup from Andrew's face. Mary nodded and helped George wash his hands. He looked anxious to go back outside. Where did that ball come from? Rachel asked. Matt had mentioned bringing a football over, but he'd been a no-show. As far as she knew, her grandmother didn't have one. I went out and bought one this morning, Roger said, surprising her yet again. Ready, boys? He went out in the backyard with both of them. Who were you talking to earlier? Rachel asked as she started to rinse the breakfast dishes and loading them into the dishwasher. Doris called. She forgot her favorite pie tin. I promised to take it back to her. I'll be just a minute. Rachel shook her head as she watched her grandmother grab her pocketbook and the car keys off the counter. Do you need me to move Roger's car? She called behind the old woman. I'll be fine. I can back out around it. With that Grandma Mary was gone. Explain to me again what's wrong and why you need me. Matt had been ambushed by the two older women as he was on his way to drive up to his grandfather's old hunting cabin in the North Carolina mountains. The last thing he wanted to do was go back to Mary's where he might run into Rachel and her husband. He didn't need her to tell him to his face that she was moving to California with the guy. Once in his life had been enough. He'd spent an entire summer up in the mountains to restore the old building. He mostly rented it out these days, but luckily no one was staying in the cabin deep in the Smoky Mountains over Thanksgiving break. We can't reach the boxes of Christmas ornaments in the shed. They are tucked away up in the rafters, and I don't want to risk using a ladder. The floorboards aren't in the best of shape. I can't reach them and Rachel is even shorter than me. What about Roger? Couldn't he get them down for you? Matt couldn't keep the resentment out of his voice. Don't even talk to me about that no-good bum. Miss Mary looked like she shared his sentiments when it came to Rachel's ex. Or maybe not so, ex. I promised the boys we'd decorate the tree tonight. Please don't make me disappoint them. It won't take more than a few minutes, Miss Doris chimed in. And I'm happy to throw in a pecan pie to sweeten the deal. I made extra yesterday. Matt knew he wasn't getting out of this with the two of them working together. Good thing his truck was packed. He should have known he was in trouble when he'd run into Miss Doris at the grocery store and she'd asked him why he was stocking up on bread and canned food. Matt had a feeling the request was a ruse. He also knew they would deny it vehemently if he called them out on it. The fastest way to get this over with was to play along. He'd follow them over to the house, get down the boxes, and hit the road from there. Give me a minute to lock up and I'll follow you to the house. Where exactly are you going? Miss Doris asked curiously when he returned with his duffel bag and added it to the blankets, pillows, and box of supplies he'd already stacked into the passenger seat of his truck. I told you. Just getting out of town for a little while. He shrugged. The last thing he wanted to do was talk about the fact that he was running away from Rachel and the disappointment of losing out to Roger and California yet again. Miss Doris and Miss Mary harumphed in unison. He got in his truck and cranked it up before they could start to drill him anymore about his travel plans. The first thing he noticed when he pulled up to the house was that Roger's car was gone. He wondered what that was about. Was he heading back early? Matt got out of the car and followed Miss Mary and Miss Doris inside. He could hear the boys playing and jumping in the trampoline by the time they got to the back door.
It's back there, Miss Mary said, pointing to the old garden shed tucked away in the far corner of the yard. He noticed the door was ajar and light was shining through the crack. He strode across the yard and stepped inside. The door slammed shut behind him and he heard a padlock click into place. What are you doing here? Rachel was surprised to see Matthew. I've been calling you all day. Each time the call had gone to voicemail. I'm supposed to get a box down for Miss Mary, so you and the boys can decorate the tree before you leave. His voice sounded strained and he turned to push on the door. She could hear it rattle, but it wasn't opening. Miss Mary, Miss Doris, Matthew called out through the locked door before starting to pound on it. This isn't funny. He sounded angry. Through the thin plywood door Rachel could hear her grandmother call the boys out of the trampoline and asking them if they wanted to go watch a movie at the island's only movie theater. Now it was her turn to bang on the wall and shout. But it was no use. Within a few minutes all was quiet in the backyard. They'd left and Rachel was starting to think that it hadn't been a mistake that she was locked in this little garden shed with Matthew. He still wouldn't look at her. Matthew, she said softly. He turned and the pain she saw in his eyes almost took her breath away. It also confused her. Are you okay? Seriously, Rachel? He looked her up and down and the pain on his face started morphing to anger. No, I'm not okay. Why would I be? She felt more confused than ever. They'd had an amazing time together over Thanksgiving and now here he was acting angry and hurt. Did she read the signals wrong? Was he mad that her grandmother and Miss Doris were meddling? Or was this payback for what she'd done to him six years ago? It would serve her right if he'd gotten close to her only to give her a taste of her own medicine. Rachel's shoulders slumped at the thought. Help me get those boxes down, she said to buy some time until she could figure out what to do next. They might not let us out without the ornaments and garlands, she said, a small smile on her lips. Fine. Matthew stepped next to her and reached up for the boxes. There were quite a few of them labeled Christmas and Rachel stacked them neatly in the corner by the door as Matthew handed them to her. Their hands brushed a few times, each little touch a reminder of what it had felt like to have him hold her, kiss her, and stroke her hair. Rachel couldn't keep the single tear from rolling down her cheek. She brushed it away angrily. Hey. Matthew's voice sounded softer and maybe even a touch concerned when he handed her the last of the boxes. We won't be stuck in here too long. I'm sure your husband will spring us out any minute. Ex-husband, Rachel replied automatically. And he won't. He's gone. Ah. Matthew said. Heading back early to get the house ready for you guys? What? No. What gave you that idea? We're staying here. It was Rachel's turn to look entirely confused. When I talked to Roger this morning, he said you guys were moving back, together, as a family. She saw the first little bit of doubt on his face and his features softened. Rachel sat on one of the larger, sturdier boxes they pulled down and patted the spot next to her. Matthew hesitated for a moment and then grabbed an old blanket that her grandmother used for summer picnics from one of the shelves and sat down next to her. Rachel hadn't noticed how cold it was in the shed. He spread it across both of their laps before turning his head to look at her. You're not getting back together with Roger and moving home, he asked. This is home. Rachel waved her hands in front of her and then burst out laughing. Not the shed, obviously. This house, Palmer Island. This is where I want to raise my boys. I have no plans to go anywhere else. She paused to look at him. What did he say to you? That he's here to pick you and the boys up and take you back to California. He said that's where your life was and some stuff about the boys missing their friends. Matthew shrugged. I can't believe, she stopped before she let her temper get away with her. Sorry. Let's just say Roger and I aren't exactly on the best of terms. I had no idea he would show up here out of the blue. And we are not moving back to California. She looked right at him, hoping he could read the truth in her eyes. 
I want to believe you. Matthew trailed off, his voice becoming softer and softer. But it feels a little too much like it did six years ago when I left. It wasn't hard to guess where his mind was going right now. He nodded, but didn't say anything. They sat silently in the shed. Rachel was racking her brain, trying to think of something to say or do to make this right. With a loud crack and a small burst of sparks, the single light bulb that illuminated the shed went out. The noise made Rachel jump and the blanket fell to the floor. The shed went dark with the only light streaming in coming from the small window in the side and a few cracks in the walls. It was just the light. Matthew put a reassuring hand on her leg and Rachel sat back down. He tucked the blanket back around the, the two of them. With the light gone, the shed suddenly felt much colder. You're shivering, Matthew said, before putting his arm around her shoulder and pulling her closer. She could feel the heat radiating off his body and started to feel better in an instant. He had such a calming presence. Thanks. Rachel snuggled a little closer to Matthew. I can't believe my grandmother and Miss Doris locked us in here and left. Matthew chuckled. I think they are trying to force us to work things out. He paused for a moment, then cleared his throat. I'm all packed up. I was heading out to the North Carolina mountains to hide and lick my wounds for a while. Rachel turned and looked at him. The pain was written all over his face, though he tried hard to cover it with a smile. She reached up to cup his face with her hand. I'm sorry. The last thing I wanted was to cause you more pain and bring up bad memories. She could feel a little stubble on his cheek. He didn't shave this morning, she realized. He must have headed over to the house as soon as he got up this morning. And I'm sorry I wasn't there when you stopped by. None of this would have happened if I hadn't avoided confronting Roger and gone back to bed. She told him how her ex had appeared unannounced at her grandmother's doorstep early in the morning, and about the chat she had with Roger later on that resulted in his leaving town before the two old ladies convinced Matt to come back here. Honestly, I can't believe you fell for that. I could have gotten those boxes down by myself, she teased to lighten the mood. I can't help myself, Matt said, the smile on his face turning more genuine. If there's a damsel in distress, I jump into action. Too bad I'm no damsel and usually take care of any distress I find myself. Rachel paused for a moment, or cause it. You're good at that, aren't you? Remember the time you forgot to close the windows on your grandma's car before the hurricane hit? Rachel groaned. She'd spent an entire school year unable to drive any of the family cars as a result. Matthew had come to her rescue, faithfully picking her up and taking her home each day. And she thanked him by dumping him the first chance she got. Can I ask you a question? I want you to answer me honestly. She kept her eyes glued to his to judge his reaction. Why do you want me back after I hurt you like this? The moment the words came out of her mouth, she regretted them. What made her think he still wanted her back? Sure, they were talking and he'd put his arm around her, but she felt pretty presumptuous thinking they were back to where she thought they left things last night. Never mind. It's a stupid question, she said quickly and started to rise to her feet. Because I never stopped loving you. Rachel sat back down and stared at him. Say that again. I never got over you, Rachel. Sure, I've met other women and even dated a few, but nothing compared to what we had. Matthew shrugged. I didn't realize it until you came back. I still love you. That's why I want you back. Even with two kids and a crazy ex? Especially with George and Andrew. They are great kids. I could do without Roger, but nothing is perfect. That made her laugh. You can say that again. Matthew grabbed her hand and looked deep into her eyes. Nothing's perfect, except you, me and the boys, and the family we could be. Yes. It wasn't really a question, but it felt like one. And she could see it, the four of them swimming in the ocean, playing in the park. A family something she never had with Roger. You look a little freaked out there, Matthew said. Don't read too much into it.
I'm not proposing marriage or anything. Just saying it would be nice to spend time with you and the boys. That's not it, Rachel said quickly. Wait. She saw the stunned look on his face and didn't want any more misunderstandings. She took a deep breath to clear her head and collect her thoughts. I'm not asking you to propose. I like the idea of spending time together. The problem is that I'm not sure how to be part of a family. There hasn't been much of one since she couldn't finish the sentence out loud. The knot forming in her throat wouldn't let her. Not since your father drowned and your mom left, he finished for her. Rachel nodded, tears pooling in her eyes. Why was she such an emotional mess today? She needed to pull herself together and figure out a way to get out of this sheet before Matthew realized just how much of a hot mess she was. Matthew's arm was still around her shoulder and he rubbed her arm soothingly. Have you talked to anyone about this since? Since she'd left Palmer Island. Back then, he had been the only person she could tell how much she missed her dad every day and how much it hurt when her mother vanished in the middle of the night. Her grandmother didn't want to talk. The memory of losing her only son too painful. Rachel's mother had become persona non grata when it became clear she wasn't coming back. Without Matthew, there had been no one to talk to who knew her parents. Have you heard anything from her? He asked. My mom? No. It's like she vanished off the face of the earth. I hired a private investigator when I was pregnant with Andrew. And after Roger had left. He couldn't find a single trace of her. I don't know where she is. She doesn't know what she's missing. She's losing out on spending time with her amazing grown daughter and two adorable grandsons. He hugged her even closer. Now, how are we going to get out of here? Do you have your phone with you? Rachel asked. Matthew shook his head. Me neither. I guess there isn't much we can do other than wait for them to get back. I wonder what we could do to pass the time, he said before leaning down to kiss her. Epilogue Christmas Eve They are finally asleep, Rachel said as she sat back down on the couch next to Matthew and leaned into him. He wrapped his arms around her and pulled her even closer. They are so excited about tomorrow. I don't remember it being such a fight to get them into bed last year. They didn't have as much to look forward to last year, Grandma Mary said from her chair next to the large Christmas tree they'd put up a few days after Thanksgiving. The space around it was covered in presents. Most of them for the boys. Rachel smiled at the thought. You have a point there. We have a lot to be thankful for. She smiled up at her grandmother. They'd gotten the call this morning. After the last round of treatments, Mary's cancer had gone into remission. She wasn't out of the woods yet, but her prognosis looked good. I think I'm calling it a night, Grandma Mary rose from her chair. I'm tired, and I'm sure those boys of yours will be up before the sun. She didn't look all that tired to Rachel. In fact, her grandmother looked better than she had since Rachel had moved back to Palmer Island. That'll give the two of you a little privacy. Was it Rachel's imagination, or did she wink at Matthew? Is everything okay? she asked, just to be sure. Of course. I thought it would be nice to read a little before bed tonight. I picked up this cute little Christmas romance and haven't had a chance to read it. What better time than tonight? Good night, you two. Why don't you make us some coffee? Matthew asked after they heard the door to the bedroom upstairs close. D cough, okay? Rachel asked. Matthew nodded, and she went into the kitchen to make a small pot. While the coffee was brewing, she put a few cookies on a plate. Once the coffee was done, she put everything on her grandmother's old wooden tray. Rumor had it that her great grandfather made it for her great grandmother as a gift the first Christmas they'd moved into this house. Rachel wasn't sure how much of that was true, but it had been used in her family for as long as she could remember. When she walked back into the living room, she just about dropped the tray. The room was dark except for the Christmas tree lights and a few candles on the coffee table. And Santa Claus sat in the chair next to the tree.
Come sit and tell me what you want for Christmas, Santa said in Matthew's voice. Rachel was too stunned to move. Too much? Matthew asked. I got it to surprise the kids in the morning. Rachel sat the tray down and went to sit in his lap. No, it isn't too much. It's very sweet of you. Good. Not well me what you want for Christmas. He put his arm around her shoulder and gave her his full attention. Rachel bit her bottom lip and thought for a moment. Her life had changed so much these past few weeks. She'd come back home and found she loved living on Palmer Island. It was the perfect place to raise the boys and there was only one person she could see herself doing that with. And he was sitting right in front of her, wearing a Santa costume, to make sure her sons had the best Christmas possible. How exactly are you planning on surprising them as Santa, she asked. There's no telling when they'll get up in the morning. I was going to stay down here and nap on the couch. Matt told her. I checked with Mary. She's fine with it. Interesting, her grandmother was in on the Santa Claus thing. Why had neither told her about it though? Now stop stalling and answer the question. What would you like for Christmas? His voice started to get impatient. You. All I want for Christmas is you in my life, she said exasperated. Good answer. Matthew shifted in the seat to pull something out of his pocket. It was a tiny little present wrapped in gold foil paper with a pretty red ribbon tied around it. Open it. Right now, she asked, accepting the small gift with shaking hands. Matthew nodded, his eyes gone serious. It took several tries before she got the bow untied, and even longer to lift the paper from the box. The tension was practically rolling off Matthew who didn't take his eyes off her the entire time. She didn't think he even blinked. Rachel drew in a breath when she saw the small velvet-covered box hidden underneath the pretty wrapping paper. Matthew's warm hand wrapped around hers and he grabbed it from her before opening it. Inside was a stunning princess-cut diamond ring. Oh, she gasped, unable to take her eyes off the ring. The lights from the tree and the candles reflected in each facet, making it sparkle in a soft golden glow. Rachel Blackwell, she looked up when he started to speak a few moments later. I should have done this a long time ago. I hope I'm not too late and you're ready to give me, to give us another chance. Would you become my wife and make me the happiest man on Palmer Island? Rachel didn't think she could get a word out around the thick lump that was forming in her throat. He still wanted her. After all this time, he wanted to spend the rest of his life with her and her boys. Her Christmas wish was true. With tears in her eyes, she nodded and he slipped the ring on her finger before lowering his fake Santa beard and kissing her. This was one Christmas Eve she would never forget. The End this has been Giving Thanks. Written by Suzanne Ash. Copyright 2019 by Suzanne Ash. Production Copyright 2022 by Suzanne Ash. Thanks for listening. Please like and subscribe if you want me to put more of my books on YouTube. Visit my website at www.suzanneash.com for more of my books or find me on Amazon.